Hey there, chemistry team. It's your chemistry coach coming at you with a new chapter 17, at least in our textbook, it's chapter 17, which is going to cover buffers and titrations. So pretty important stuff here. Now, we've already done titrations in our labs, um, so I'm not going to focus too much on that right now. We're going to hit that later. But for buffers, we need to go through buffers so we can do some of our labs. It's going to be critical. So I'm going to break up Chapter 17 into three parts. Um, so part one will just be Section 1, and that's going to cover what's called the common ion effect. And we sort of talked about that already, but we haven't officialized it yet. I don't know if that's a word, officialized, but it, it's that's an officialized word, officialized now. Very simple. So I'll do one quick video on the common ion effect. But I'll do a problem on it to just kind of review ice tables and whatnot to show you how this common ion effect really affects the ionization of acids and bases, weak acids and weak bases in other species. Or if you have, say, a strong acid in the presence of a weak acid. Woo. Um, section two, we're going to hit buffers. That was kind of a weird one for me when I was a general chemistry student. It took me a while for my brain to wrap around it. But once you get it, it's pretty important. We're going to be doing a whole lab just on buffers. Um, so we'll hit that and then I'm going to stop there. I'm going to do those two videos and then I'm going to stop chapter 17. I'm not going to cover titration curves until after we cover some other chapters necessary for our labs because we don't need to know the information for titration curves to be able to succeed and do calculations in our labs at this point. So we will hit the first video on common ion effects, second video on buffers. There may, might be one or two videos for each one depending on the length of the problems and we'll get cranking. So let me pause it here. And <laughs> April Fool's Day, one of my kids left me a message. Apparently, that's how my kid pictures me with my spiky hair. Oh, my, does that, how's that look? <laughs> that's how my class pictures me. Yeah! So, anyway, let's make this, I'm going to race this up. We'll do the common ion effect. All right, let's think about this common ion effect. I think we've already done it. So, if you need to review Le Chatelier's principle, go back to that video. And uh, so important concept because that's going to do a lot with the common ion effect. <laughs> You'll see a lot of different definitions for this. But in general, if you have an equilibrium system, right, some equilibrium equation like this one, <clears throat> if any species is added to that system, that's at equilibrium. Remember, at equilibrium, all the concentrations are constant. If we add something to it, we're disturbing it. Welcome to Le Chatelier's principle, right? But if I add any species to it that contains any ion in that species, that would be called a common ion. They have it in common. The equilibrium system has it. The species you're adding to it has that. Right? So, for example, if we've got this equilibrium system with some generic weak acid, HA, so it's ionizing and forms this equilibrium system. Notice the conjugate base, A minus, whatever that is. doesn't matter. be some anion. If I add something to it, that contains that A minus. So like, you know, the sodium salt of A minus, the potassium salt, the ammonium salt, whatever it is, some salt ionic species that's 100% soluble, you add it to there, and so we're increasing this. This is going to respond, right? This is the key to the common ion effect. The system will respond via Le Chatelier's principle because you've disrupted the system by shifting. And remember, when you increase the concentrations of something in Le Chatelier's principle, it shifts away from it because if we increase A minus, right? So if we add the sodium salt or potassium salt containing that conjugate base anion here, it's going to increase that. So this system will shift to the left away from the A minus to try and bring it back down and create a new equilibrium system with new equilibrium concentrations, although Ka would still say stay constant, right? So all the concentrations adjust to keep Ka constant. What happens is this shifts, right? So even though you added the A minus, it's going to go down a little bit. It probably won't go down to its original amount, but it's going to try to head that direction. But you're definitely going to be shifting this way. So you're going to increase the amount of Ha at equilibrium than there would have been earlier. So if we shift back, back this direction, oh, let me move my little picture for my kids here. Think about it. If we think in terms of like the percent ionization, right? This is going to lose X amount heading over this direction. Adding this shifts it so it suppresses or reduces the weak acid ionization. Ooh, interesting. Interesting. 
this is the net effect of the common ion effect. If you add a common ion that's on the side, shifts back this direction, the weak acid will ionize less. Its percent ionization will go down. Same thing if this is a weak base and you add its conjugate acid, boom, it shifts back away from it and it suppresses the base ionization. If I have a solid that's dissolving, right? If I add any of the ions in common with that solid, boom, back it goes and it reduces the solubility of that solid. Hey, hey, let's do a few examples uh, to show you uh, qualitatively what's happening with specific species, and then we'll do a quantitative one. All right, gang, here is our three examples of the common ion effect, qualitatively, not putting numbers to it. We'll do one problem where we can actually calculate the decrease in the percent ionization. We'll do a weak acid on that one. But let's start with weak acid. Again, acids and bases, weak acids, weak bases follow the same pattern. If you add a common ion to a weak acid that's in equilibrium, it will decrease the percent ionization. Again, that's given that term alpha. That little alpha is the, the uh, percent ionization. Same thing with weak bases. That uh, ionization, that weak base will also decrease. Look, if I have some weak acid, doesn't matter what it is, this happens to be an organic one, benzoic acid. If that ionizes in water, that's gonna donate its H plus to form hydronium and leave the conjugate base there. I think that's a benzoate ion or something. I'm not a big organic guy. Here's the equilibrium. If I add any species that contains that anion, maybe the, the sodium salt, potassium salt, uh, something like that, that will increase and shift it back towards that acid and it reduces the ionization, right? That percent ionization drops down. Or if I add anything that contains the hydronium ion, it'll shift this way. So say for example, if I added a strong acid to this equilibrium system, that would increase the hydronium ion dramatically, push it back this way, and that suppresses the ionization of the weak acid. So in the presence, so we're gonna see an example, if you have the presence of weak acid with a strong uh, strong acid mixed together, that strong acid suppresses the ionization of the weak acid, reducing its hydronium ion contribution. And that's gonna allow us to make a really nice assumption in, in a second uh, when dealing with combinations, mixtures of strong and weak acids and how to figure out the pH, because that can be challenging. What if you have both? We're gonna make another nice assumption. All right, let's take a look at the weak base. This happens to be quinoline. If you look on your KB table, there's a lot of weird, you know, kind of like drug looking things on there. <laughs> right? You'll learn that when you get an organic. This happens to be quinoline. There's a nitrogen there. All right. That turns out that that has a lone pair on it. It can accept an H plus. So that's going to take an H plus from the water, producing the hydroxide ion and then the conjugate acid of the quinoline. So you just add the hydrogen and the positive charge like we've done before. If I, here's the equilibrium system. If I add anything that contains the hydroxide ion, like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, or anything that contains that conjugate acid, right? Maybe the chlorine salt, the chloride salt, right? Or the bromide salt of that. That will break up and form the chloride in this. The chloride wouldn't do anything, but this would. That would shift it back this direction, suppressing or reducing uh, the ionization that weak base. Hey. And then last but not least, it's going to be one of the later chapters for us, chapter 18. We can look at the equilibrium. Ooh, I forgot my reversible arrow. That wouldn't have been bad. That doesn't go 100%. That would only be for soluble salts. So for slightly soluble, what we thought of uh, last semester is insoluble salts. They're not quite exactly insoluble. They all dissolve a little bit. Forms an equilibrium between the solid and its ions in solution, right? So if I've got this nice equilibrium system going and this has a specific solubility, say so many grams per liter of water, we'll be able to calculate that later. If I add either the cation from that solid or the anion, in this case the calcium ion or the oxalate ion, so if I added say calcium chloride or calcium nitrate or something, that would dissolve up, the nitrate wouldn't do anything, the chloride wouldn't do anything, but the calcium would increase shifting it back towards the solid, reducing how much that solid can dissolve. So the number of grams per liter would actually decrease. Um, it's temperature dependent, of course. If I added anything containing oxalate, sodium oxalate, ammonium oxalate, something like that, boom, it would shift back this way, decrease the solubility of the solid. Pretty simple. It's just a shot, an application of shot today's principle. Let's look at a, a specific uh, problem for mixtures of strong acids and weak acids. 
Uh, I'm not going to, well, yeah, we could calculate that. be pretty easy. And then we'll do one to show the decrease in percent ionization. We might have to do a second video for that. All right. So here's the first of two applications we're going to do for the common ion effect. The first will be for mixtures of strong acids with weak acids or correspondingly strong bases with weak bases. Same concept. <clears throat> so the, the problem with this is you've got the strong acid 100% ionizing in water, producing tons of hydronium ion. You've got the weak acid ionizing a little bit, producing a, a hydronium ion. And you've got water auto-ionization, producing a little tiny bit of hydronium ion. You've got three sources. Same if you had a base. If you had a strong base, 100% ionization to form, or dissociation really, to form um, OH minus. You've got the weak base ionizing a little bit to form a little bit of OH minus, and water auto ionization forming a little bit of OH minus. Same idea. You're just looking at hydronium versus hydroxide. Because of the common ion effect, that's going to suppress the strong acids. H3O plus is going to suppress the weak acids ionization, which was already a small, con the weak acid was already a small contribution of hydronium. Now it's even smaller, went from tiny to little ditty itty bit because the strong acid suppresses its ionization from the common ion effect. So the net result is we have three sources of hydronium. We can ignore any hydronium from the weak acid. Buh bye because of the suppression of its ionization from the strong acid. We can ignore any H3O plus from water ionization, auto ionization. That was small already, and the strong acid suppresses that as well. Bye bye That leaves only one source, the strong acid. So this becomes like a 15-second problem. Ooh, but if you don't realize that on the test, you're going to waste 10, 15 minutes farting around with this thing, getting nowhere, going down a bad rabbit hole. Let me show you how easy this actually is. It'll be a joke for you guys once you see how to apply the tricks. You ready for a problem? All right, gang, write this problem down. And if you're feeling daring on this April Fool's Day, give it a shot and see if you can do it based on just the brief stuff I mentioned before. So we've got a, a mixture of acetic acid, 0 0.154 molar acetic acid, and that is mixed with some hydroiodic acid with 0.021 molar. Notice the concentration of the hydroiodic acid is smaller, but the hydro, you've got to, got to, got to know your strong acids and weak acids. If you don't, you're toast, as they say in Minnesota, toast. You, you gotta know what's strong and what's weak. You just can't do it. All right, you gotta know that hydroiodic acid. Notice I was a booger head and I didn't give you the, the uh, chemical formulas. <laughs> so you gotta do your nomenclature, guys. Hydroiodic acid is, iodic acid is strong, acetic acid is weak. So we got the three sources. We got the hydroiodic acid, the acetic acid, and the water autoionization. All give us H2O plus. Use your assumptions. See if you can get the pH of the solution for me. Pause the video. Give it a shot. See how you do, gang. I just realized that I didn't need to pause it myself. <laughs> you pause your video. I don't need to pause mine. That was silly. All right. <laughs> so just... I cracked myself up. All right, here we go. We got three sources of H3O plus, right? Number one, we've got our acetic acid. Number two, we've got our hydrochloric acid. I'm not hydro, hydroiodic acid. We're so used to hydrochloric acid, right? And number three, we've got our water autoionization. We are going to be able to eliminate the acetic acid, right? We're going to ignore the weak acid. We're going to ignore water auto ionization. And we're going to only include the strong acid. Nice, huh? Because that strong acid is suppressing both of those. Let me show you how that works real quick. Let's set up the Hc2H3O2. Here's your acetic acid. That's going to, that's your weak acid, right? That's going to ionize in water. 
That's an ugly cue. That's going to produce the acetate ion and the hydronium ion. Let's look at the HI. That will also ionize in water, but that goes to 100% extent because this is strong. That'll produce the iodide ion plus the hydronium ion. Do you see that these have hydronium ion in common game? So this hydronium ion is going to affect that via the common ion effect. So we've got a common ion here, right? So the production of massive amounts of hydronium ion from the strong acid adds hydronium ion to this, which shifts that back and it reduces the ionization of the weak acid, which was producing so little of this anyway. This is my dominant source. You could set up water autoionization and do exactly the same thing. All right, so now all we've reduced this from a really hairy, nasty problem to just a simple problem of what's the pH of a strong acid. Let me do it. This is what you got, gang. So again, from the last one, we ignore, we're ignoring the weak acid, ignoring water autoionization, only worrying about the hydro, hydroiodic acid. I rewrote that ionization to 100%. We need that because we need the concentration of hydronium ion. Well, if this is 100%, then the concentration of the hydronium ion should be exactly the same as the concentration of the original hydroiodic acid because the one-to-one -one mole ratio, same is true with the iodide ion. These would all be the concentration I gave you in the problem, 0 0.021 molar. Uh, make sure you don't get those switched up, right? So this would be the I minus, the H0 plus, the HI, they're all gonna be the same concentration. Now I know the concentration of hydronium, boom! P on it, pH, negative log the hydronium ion concentration, plug that 0.021 in there, two significant digits in the concentration, gives us two decimal places in the pH, I get 1.6777, good to two decimal places, so that's closer to 1.68 than it is to 1.67. Our pH of this mixture would be 1.68, right? So once you see it, you can just, all, like on an exam, you don't have to go through all that junk that I just went through. Just say strong acid dominates, ignore the weak acid, ignore water, water auto, auto, that's water, uh, water auto ionization, Mr. Roboto, right? Domo arigato, water auto ionization. Um, so just say, boom, ignore them, take the negative, show that these are the same, take the negative log, done. Or you say it's less than a one minute problem. All right, so in the next video, because this is going to take a little longer, we're going to look at the second aspect of the common ion effect. Um, what if we have a weak acid or a weak base? Um, what would be the decrease in the percent ionization? So we'll do a traditional one without the common ion, look at what its percent ionization is, and then we'll take that exact same species and concentration uh, and add a common ion this time and actually quantitatively calculate the percent decrease in its, per or the, the decrease in its percent ionization. All right, gang.